Section three of the Notting Hill Mystery by Charles Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three. Item one. Extract from Mrs. Anderton's journal. August thirteenth, eighteen fifty four. Here we are then, finally established at Notting Hill. Jane laughs at us for coming to town, just as every one else is leaving it. But in my eyes, and I am sure in dear William's too, that is the pleasantest time for us. Poor Willie, he grows more and more sensitive to blame from any one, and has been sadly worried by this discussion about our Dresden trip. The new professor to-morrow, I wonder what he will be like. August 14th. And so that is the new professor. I do not think I was ever so astonished in my life. That little stout squab man, the most powerful mesmerist in Europe. And yet he certainly is powerful, for he had scarcely made a pass over me before I felt a glow through my whole frame. There is something about him, too, when one comes to look at him more closely, which puzzles me very much. He certainly is not the commonplace man he appears, though it would be difficult just now to say what makes me so sure of it. August 25th quite satisfied now. How could I have ever thought the Baron commonplace? And yet, at first sight, his appearance is certainly against him. He is not a man with whom I should like to quarrel. I don't think he would have much compunction in killing any one who offended him, or who stood in his way. How quietly he talks of those hurried experiments in the medical schools, and the tortures they inflict on the poor hospital patients. Willie says it is all nonsense, and says all doctors talk so, but I can't help feeling that there is something different about him, and yet he is certainly doing me good. September 1st. Better and better, and yet I cannot conquer the strange feeling which is growing upon me about the Baron. He is certainly an extraordinary man. What a grasp he takes of anything on which he rests his hand even for a moment, and how perfectly he seems to disregard anything that stands in his way. This morning I was at the window when he came, and I was quite frightened when I saw him, as I thought so nearly run over. But I might have spared my anxiety, for my gentleman just quietly walked on, while the poor horse started almost across the road. Had it caught sight of those wonderful green eyes of his, that it seemed so frightened? What eyes they are! You can hardly ever see them, but when you do! And yet the man is certainly doing me good." September the 11th. So it is settled that the Baron is not to mesmerise me himself any more. Am I sorry or glad? At all events, I hope they will not now worry poor William. September 13th. First day of Mademoiselle Rosalie. Seems a nice person enough, but it feels very odd to lie there on the sofa while someone else is being mesmerised for one. September 15th. This new plan is beginning to answer. I think I feel the mesmerism even more than when I was mesmerised myself, and this way one gets all the pleasures and none of the disagreeables. It is so delicious. Looked back to-day at my Malvern journals. So odd to see how I disliked the idea at first, and now I could hardly live without it. September 29th. I think we shall soon be able to do without the Baron altogether. I am sure Rosalie and I could manage very well by ourselves. What a wonderful thing this mesmerism is! To think that the mere touch of another person's hand should soothe away pain and fill one with health and strength. Really, if I had not always kept a journal, I should feel bound to keep one now as a record of the wonderful effects of this extraordinary cure. Got up this morning with a nasty headache. No appetite for breakfast, eyes heavy, and pulse low. Poor William in terrible tribulation, when, lo, in comes little Mademoiselle Rosalie and the Baron. The gentleman makes a pass or two, the lady pops her little dry, monkey-looking paw upon my forehead, and, presto, the headache has vanished, and I'm calling for chocolate and toast. September 30th. A blank day. Headache again this morning, and looking out anxiously for my little brown good angel, when in comes the Baron, with the news that she cannot come. 
up all night with a dying lady, and so fagged this morning that he is afraid she would do me more harm than good. I am sure she cannot feel more fagged than I do, poor girl. But after all, in spite of the delight of doing so much good, what a life it must be! October 1st. Rosalie here again. Headache vanished. Everything bright as the October sun outside. I am getting quite fond of that girl. How I wish she could speak something besides German! October 4th. It is quite extraordinary what a hold that poor girl, Rosalie, is taking upon me. I am even beginning to dream of her at night. October 6th. Headache again this morning, and a message that Rosalie cannot come. How provoking that it is on the same day! October 12th. I think I shall really soon begin to know when poor Rosalie has been overworked. Headache again today, and I had a presentiment that she would not be able to come. October 20th. So now the Baron is going to leave us. Well, I am indeed thankful that he can now so well be spared. Jane Morgan here today, and of course laughing at the idea of mesmerism doing any good. She could not deny, though, how wonderfully better I am. And, indeed, but for those tiresome headaches, which always seem to come just when poor Rosalie is too tired to take them away, I am really quite well and strong. October 31st. Something evidently wrong between poor Rosalie and the Baron. She has evidently been crying, and I suppose it must be from sympathy, but I feel exactly as if I had been crying too. Very little satisfaction from the mesmerism today. It seems rather as if it had given me some of poor Rosalie's depression. How I wish she could speak English, or that I could speak German, and then I would find out what is the matter. Perhaps she is to lose her work when the Baron goes. Memo to ask him to-morrow. November 1st. No, he says he shall certainly take her with him to Germany, and he hopes that may have a beneficial effect. What can that mean? He says she is quite well, but throws out mysterious insinuations as to something being wrong with her. How I do wish I could speak German! November 3rd. Still that uncomfortableness between Baron and Rosalie. I am sure there is something wrong, and that she wants to speak to me about it, but is afraid of him. It certainly is strange that he should never leave us alone. A memo to ask William to get him out of the way a little while to-morrow, though what good that will be when she and I cannot understand each other I hardly know after all. November 4th. What a day this has been! I feel quite tired out with the excitement, and yet I cannot make up my mind to go to bed until I have written it all down. In the first place, this is to be my last visit from Rosalie, at all events till they come back from the continent. I cannot help perceiving that William is not altogether sorry that she is going. Dear fellow, I do really believe that he is more than half jealous of my extraordinary feeling for her. And certainly it is extraordinary that a woman, quite in another class of life, of whom one knows nothing, should have taken such a hold upon one. I suppose it must be the mesmerism, which certainly is a very mysterious thing. If it is so, it is at all events very fortunate it did not take that turn with the Baron himself. Oh, I can really begin to understand now all the objections I thought so foolish and so tiresome three or four months ago before Rosalie first came. And yet, after all, I don't think, in spite of mesmerism or anything else, one need ever have been afraid of liking the Baron too much. I could quite understand being afraid of him. Rosalie evidently is, and to own the truth so am I a little, or I should not have been beaten in that way to-day. Today was my last séance with Rosalie, and I had made up my mind to get the Baron out of the way and try to get something out of Rosalie. They came at two o'clock as usual, and, as I thought, I would not lose a chance. I had got dear William to lie in wait in his study and call to the Baron as he passed in hopes that Rosalie would come up alone. That was no use, however, for the Baron kept his stout little self perseveringly between her and the staircase, and when I went, thinking to be very clever, to the top of the staircase, and called her to come up, it only gave him an excuse for breaking away from poor William altogether, and coming straight up to me before her. I was so provoked, I could hardly be civil. 
Well, of course, the Baron was in a great hurry, and we went to work at once with the mesmerising. When that was done, we both tried to keep them talking, and I made signs to William to get the Baron out of the way. I was really beginning to get quite anxious about it, and kept on repeating over and over to myself the two German words I had learned on purpose from Jane Morgan this morning. It was no use, however, and I began to grow quite nervous, and I am quite sure Rosalie saw what I was wanting, for she seemed to get fidgety too, and then that made me more nervous still. At last the Baron declared he must go, and they both got up to leave. William would have given it up, but he says I looked so imploringly at him he could not resist, so made one more effort by asking the Baron to come into his study for a short private consultation. This he refused, saying he had not the time, but could say anything needful where we were. Then William told me to take Rosalie into the next room, but the Baron would not have that either, though he laughed when he said he could not trust to a lady's punctuality in this case, but if I would leave Rosalie she would not understand anything that was said. Of course this would not do, and at last William, with more presence of mind and determination than I should have thought him capable of, took him by the buttonhole and fairly drew him away into the further window, where he began whispering eagerly to him to draw off his attention. I suppose it was the consciousness of a sort of stratagem, but my heart beat quite fast as I brought out my two words, Gibst was, and I could see that hers was so too. She seemed surprised at my speaking to her in German, and certainly I was no less so to hear her answer in English, with a slight accent certainly, but still in quite plain English. Don't seem to listen. I am— And then she stopped suddenly and turned quite pale, and I could feel all my own blood rush back to my heart with such a throb. I looked up, and there were the Baron's eyes fixed upon us. Poor Rosalie seemed quite frightened, and I declare I felt so too. At all events we neither of us ventured on another word, and the next minute the Baron succeeded in fairly shaking off poor William and taking his leave. So there is an end of my little romance about Rosalie. I am sure there was something in it. Why, if she had nothing particular to say, should she have taken the trouble of learning that little bit of English? And why— but I must not sit here all night speculating about this, which, after all, is, I dare say, nothing at all. It is positively just twelve o'clock. November 6th. How strange! There is certainly some mystery about Rosalie and the Baron. I am quite certain I saw them in a cab together this morning, and yet they were to cross on Saturday night and be in Paris yesterday. I wonder whether they were late after all, and yet an hour and a half is surely time enough to London Bridge, and if he had missed the train, I should think he would have come to us yesterday. At all events, he might have gone early this morning. It is very odd. November 7th. I wonder whether any one ever had such a husband as I have got. Yesterday he must needs worry himself with the idea that I am fretting about the loss of my mesmerism. As if I could possibly think a moment about the loss of anything— when I had got him with me. So nothing would satisfy him but that we must go to the Haymarket to see Paul Pry and the Spanish dancers. I have not laughed so much for many a long day. I don't like all that violent dancing, so we came away directly after the absurd little farce, how to pay the rent, how we did laugh at it, to be sure, and the absurdities of that little monkey Clark. Right, too, in Paul Pry is quite inimitable. Dear William, how good it was of him. December 5th. Just going to the theatre again, when news came of poor Harry Morton's illness. My own dear William, how good he is to every one, and so prompt, too. Touch his heart or his honour, and the Duke himself could not be more quick and decided. The news only came as we were dressing, and to-morrow we are off to Naples, to meet poor Mr. Morton, and nurse him. December 6th. There is no one like Willie. After all the scramble we have had to get ready, he would not take me across when it was so rough. So we have taken two dear little rooms from day to day, because Willie cannot bear the publicity of a hotel, and I am sure I hate it too, and we are to wait until it is fine enough to cross. December 9th. Still here, but the wind has gone down almost suddenly within the last three hours, and to-morrow morning I hope we really shall cross. Dear William is getting quite worried. I persuaded him to take me to a lecture that was going on, 
and while we were there the wind went down, and we have been packing up ever since. Twelve o'clock, and William calling to me. I must just put down about Mr. Good heaven! What is the matter? I feel so ill. Quite. Item 2. Statement of Dr. Watson. My name is James Watson, and I am a physician of about thirty years standing. In 1854 I was practising at Dover. On the night of the 9th of December that year, I was sent for hurriedly to see a lady of the name of Anderton, who had been taken suddenly ill immediately after her return from a lecture at the town hall, which she had attended with her husband. The message was brought by the servant from the lodgings where they were living. On our way to the house, she told me that the lady was dying, and the poor gentleman quite distracted. On arriving at the house I found Mr. Anderton supporting his wife in his arms. He seemed greatly agitated, and cried, "'For God's sake, be quick! I think she has got the cholera!' Mrs. Anderton was on the couch in her dressing-room, partially undressed, but with two or three blankets thrown over her, as she seemed shivering with the cold. There was a good fire in the room, but notwithstanding this and the blankets, her hands and feet were both quite chilly. Footnote. This portion of Dr. Watson's statement, relating entirely to the symptoms of Mrs. Anderton's case, though some details are excluded, necessarily contains much that must be interesting only to the medical profession, and disagreeable to the general reader. The following paragraph may therefore be passed over, merely noting that the symptoms were such as would be compatible with antimonial poisoning. I asked Mr. Anderton why she had not been got to bed, to which he replied that she had been vomiting until within a very few moments so violently that they had been unable to move her. Almost immediately on my arrival the vomiting recommenced, though there appeared to be now hardly anything left in the stomach to come away. The retching continued with unabated violence for more than an hour after the stomach had been evidently completely emptied, and was accompanied with great purging and severe cramps both in the stomach and the extremities. I at once sent to my house for a portable bath I happened to have hired for my own wife's use, and on its arrival placed Mrs. Anderton in it at a temperature of ninety-eight degrees, having previously added three-quarters of a pound of mustard. While waiting for the bath, I administered thirty drops of laudanum in a wine-glassful of hot brandy and water, but without in any degree checking the purging, which continued almost incessantly, and was of a most watery character. It was accompanied also by violent pains and great swelling of the epigastrum. A fresh dose of opium was equally unsuccessful, nor was any amelioration of symptoms produced by the exhibition of prussic acid and creosote. On removing the patient from the warm bath, I had her carefully placed in bed, shortly after which she began to perspire profusely, but without any relief to the other symptoms. I now began to fear that some deleterious substance had been unconsciously swallowed, the more especially as the patient had, up to the very moment of her seizure, been in unusually good health. I therefore made careful examinations with the view to detecting the presence of arsenic, and instituted, by the aid of Mr. Anderton, the strictest inquiries as to whether there was in the house any preparation containing this or any other irritant poison. Nothing of the kind could, however, be found, nor were such tests I was at the time in a position to apply, able to detect anything of the kind to which my suspicions were directed. Deliberate poisoning proved, moreover, on consideration entirely out of the question, as there could be no doubt of Mr. Anderton's devoted attachment to his wife, and the people of the house were entire strangers to her. Moreover, the length of time since any food had been taken was almost conclusive against such a supposition. Mrs. Anderton had dined at six o'clock, and between that hour and midnight, when the attack came on, had eaten nothing but a biscuit and part of a glass of sherry and water, the remainder of which was in the glass upon the dressing-room table when I arrived. Since then I have removed portions of all the matters tested, as well as the remaining wine and water, and have had them thoroughly examined by a scientific chemist, but equally without result. I am compelled, therefore, to believe that the symptoms arose from some natural, though undiscovered, cause, possibly from a sudden chill in coming from the heated rooms into the night air, 
though this seems hardly compatible with the fact that she never complained of cold during the long drive home, and that she was seated comfortably in her dressing-room, making her customary entries in her journal when the attack came on. Another very suspicious circumstance was that, afterwards mentioned by her, of a strong metallic taste in the mouth, a symptom sometimes occasioned, and in conjunction likewise with the others noticed in her case, by the exhibition of excessive doses of antimony in the form of an emetic tartar. This medicine, however, has never been prescribed for her, nor was there any possibility of her having had access to any in mistake. At Mr. Anderton's request, however, I exhibited the remedies used in such a case as port wine, infusion of oak bark, etc., but with as little effect as the other medicines. Indeed, the remedies of whatever kind were precluded from exercising their full action by the extreme irritability of the stomach, by which they were ejected almost as soon as swallowed. This being the case, I abandoned any further attempt at the exhibition of the heavy doses I had hitherto employed, or, indeed, of drugs of any kind, and confined myself, until the irritation of the epigastrum should have been in some measure allayed, to a treatment I have occasionally found successful in somewhat similar cases, the administration, that is to say, of simple soda-water, in repeated doses of a teaspoonful at a time. I have often found this to remain with good effect upon the stomach, when everything else was at once rejected, nor was I disappointed in the present case. About an hour after commencing this treatment, the first violence of the symptoms began to subside, and by the next afternoon the case had resolved itself into an ordinary one of severe gastroenteritis, which I then proceeded to treat in the regular manner. After quite a short period, as I could possibly have expected, this also was subdued, leaving the patient, however, in a state of great prostration, and subject to night perspirations of a most lowering character. I now began to throw in tonics, and to resort, though very cautiously, to a more invigorating diet. Under this treatment she continued steadily to improve, though the perspiration still continued, and her constitution cannot be said to have at all recovered the severe shock it had sustained by the month of April, 1855, when they left Dover, by my recommendation, for a change of air. Since that time I have not seen her. I am quite unable to account for the seizure from any cause but that of a chill, an hypothesis which, I must admit, rests its authority almost solely on the fact that no other can be found. Item 3. Extracts from Mrs. Anderton's Journal. Continued. January 20th, 1855. At last I get back once more to my old brown friend. Footnote. Apparently the journal, which is bound in brown Russian leather. Dear old thing, how pleasant its old face seems. Very little today, though, only a word or two, just to say it is done. Oh, how it tries one. January 25th. My own dear husband's birthday, and thank heaven I am once more able to sit with him. Oh, how kind he has been through all these weary weeks, when I have been so fretful and impatient. Why should buffering make one cross? God knows I have suffered. I never thought to live through that terrible night. It makes me shudder to think of it. And then that horrid, death-like, leaden taste, that was the worst of all. Well, thank God, I am better now, but so weak. I am quite tired with writing even these few lines. February 12th. How weak I still am. Walked out to-day with dear William for the first time upon the pier, but had scarcely got to the end of it when I felt so tired I was obliged to sit down while poor William went to fetch a chair to take me home. February 13th. I have been quite startled to-day. I was talking to Dr. Watson about my being so tired yesterday, and about how very weak I still was, and how ill I had been, and at last he let slip that, at the time, he thought I had been poisoned. He gave me quite a turn, and then he tried to make us talk of something else, but I could not get it out of my head, and kept coming back and back to it, and wondering who could have had any possible interest in poisoning poor me. And so we went on talking, and at last Dr. Watson said something which let out that at first he had suspected William, my own William, my precious, precious husband. Oh, I thought I should have choked on the spot, 
"'I don't know what I said, but I do know I—I I could not have said too much, and poor William tried to laugh it off, and said, "'Who else would have gained anything by it? "'Would he not have had that miserable twenty-five thousand pounds? "'And besides him there was no one but the charities in India, "'and they could not have done it, "'because they would not exist till we were gone. "'But I could see how he winced at the idea, "'and I felt as though my blood were really boiling in my veins. "'And then that man, oh, how thankful, "'I shall be glad when we get away from him, "'tried to persuade me that he had not really thought it. "'I should think not, indeed, "'and that he soon saw it was impossible, and all that, "'and at last I fairly burst out crying with passion "'and ran out of the room. "'And, and... I could cry now to think of my poor dear Willie being— and I shall too if I go on thinking about it any longer, so I will write no more to-night. February 15th. No journal yesterday. I really could not trust myself to write. And poor Willie, though he tried to laugh at it, I could see how bitterly he felt the imputation. Good heaven, think if that wretched man had really charged him with it. It would have killed him, I know it would, and he would rather have died a thousand times. "'Well, I must not think of it any more. "'Only once more, thank heaven, we shall soon be going away. "'April 7th. "'Back once more at home, thank heaven. "'But how slow, how very slow, this convalescence, as they call it. "'Oh, shall I ever be well again, as I was last year before that horrid day at Dover? "'May the 3rd. "'So we are to leave England for a time and try the German baths. "'I am almost thankful for it. I have grown very fond, too, of this dear little luxurious house, though I could hardly say why. It is like my wonderful fancy for Rosalie. Ah, oh, poor Rosalie! I wonder where she is now, and when they will return. I cannot help thinking that she might do me some good. But, as I was saying, fond as I am of this dear little house, I shall be really glad to leave it for a time, and see what change of air will do for me. If I could only get rid of those terrible night perspirations— it is that they pull me down so, and make me so weak and miserable. Oh, what would I not give to be well once more, if it were only to get rid of the memory of that time? July 7th. Safe at Baden-Baden, and too early as yet for the majority of the English pleasure-seekers. What a delicious place it is! I declare I feel myself better already. September the 11th. Really almost well again. Quite a comfortable talk to-day with dear Willie about that foolish Dr. Watson. The first time the subject has been mentioned between us since that day when I got into such a passion about it. Poor man, he was hardly worth going into a rage about. We heard to-day of his having made some terrible blunder in the new place he has gone to, and lost all his practice by killing some poor old woman through it. It was this made us talk of his poisoning notion. "'and, oh, how glad I was to see that dear Willie "'had quite got over his nervousness about it. "'We had quite a long talk, "'and at last he promised me faithfully "'never to say a word more about it to any one. "'October 10th. "'Home again at last, and in our own dear little house. "'And really I feel once more as well and strong "'as this time last year. "'Dear William, too, how happy he is. "'The shadow seems quite to have passed away. "'God grant it may not return.' October 30th. An eventful day, all the morning at the Crystal Palace, and just as we returned, who should walk in but the Baron R. It was just a year since he left us, but he had not altered in the very least. I do not think that short square figure, with the impenetrable rosy face and the large white hands, and those wonderful great green eyes that you can so rarely catch, and when you have caught, so invariably wish you had let alone, can ever change. I am afraid I was not very cordial to him. I ought to be, for he has done great things for me, and yet somehow when I saw him I felt quite a cold shudder run all through me. Dear William saw it and asked if I was ill, and when I laughed and said, No, it was only some one walking over my grave, I could not help fancying that for a moment the Baron's lips seemed to turn quite white, and I just caught one glance from those awful eyes that seemed as if it would read me through and through. "'and yet, after all, it may have been only fancy, "'for the next moment he was talking in his rich, quiet voice "'as though nothing could ever disturb him. "'So, Rosalie is gone. "'That is clear at all events, "'though what has exactly become of her 
I cannot quite so well understand. From all I can make out, she seems, poor girl, to have married very foolishly, and it was that that was the matter between them when they went away last year. The Baron seemed indeed to hint at something even worse, but he would not speak out plainly, and I would defy any one to make that man say one word more than he may choose. Poor Rosalie, I hope she has not come to any harm. November 1st. Another visit from the Baron, to say good-bye before he returns to his wife. How strange that we should never have heard of her before, and even now I cannot make out whether he has married since he left us, or whether he was always so. Certainly that man is a mystery, and just now it pleases him to talk especially in enigmas. He does not seem disposed, however, to put up with vague information on our part. I thought he would never have done questioning poor William and me about my illness, and at last he drew it out of me, not out of William, dear fellow, what that foolish Dr. Watson had said. After all, I am not sorry I told him, for it was quite a relief to hear him speak so strongly of the absurdity of such an idea, and I am sure it was a comfort to poor William. He, the Baron, spoke very strongly too about the danger of setting such ideas about, and particularly cautioned dear Willie not to mention it to any one. I knew he would not have done so in any way, but this will make him more comfortable. April the 3rd. Such a delightful day, and so tired. I never saw Richmond look so lovely, and how dear Willie and I did enjoy ourselves in that lovely park. But, oh, I'm so sleepy. Not a word more. April 5th. Another lovely day. Strolling about Lord Holland's Park all the morning, and this evening some music in our own dear little drawing-room. How happy, how very happy. Good heaven, what is this? That old horrible leaden taste, and, oh, so deadly sick. April 6th. Thank heaven the attack seems to have passed away. Oh, how it frightened me. Thank heaven, too, I was able to keep the worst from dear William, and he did not know how like it was to that other dreadful time. April 20th. Again, that horrible sickness, and worse, oh, far worse, still that awful deadly leaden taste, worse this time, too, than the last, in bed all day yesterday. Poor Willie, terribly anxious. Pray heaven it may not come again. May the 6th. Another attack. God help me. If this should go on, I do not know what will become of me. Already I am beginning to feel weaker and weaker. Poor Willie. These last three days have been terrible ones for him. However, the doctor says it will all pass off. Pray heaven it may. May 25th. More sickness, more derangement, more of that horrible leaden taste. The doctor himself is beginning to look uncomfortable, and I can see that poor Willie's mind is reverting to that terrible suggestion a year ago. Thank heaven! I have as yet managed to conceal from him and from Dr. Dodsworth that horrid deadly taste which made such an impression on Dr. Watson. Oh, when will this end? June 10th. A horrible suspicion is taking possession of me. What can this mean? I look back through my journal, and it is every fortnight that this fearful attack returns. The 5th and 18th of April, 3rd and 21st of May, and now again the 7th of this month, and that terrible leaden taste which is now almost constantly in my mouth, and with every attack my strength failing and failing. Oh, God, what can it be? June 26th. Another fortnight, another attack. There must be foul play somewhere, and yet who could, who would, do such a thing? Oh, thank heaven I have still concealed from my poor William that worst symptom of all, the horrible leaden taste, which is now never out of my mouth. My precious Willie, how kind, how good he is to me! July 12th. I cannot hold out much longer now. Each time the attack returns I lose something of the little, the very little strength that is left. God help me! I feel now that I must go. The Baron came to-day, and for a moment my poor boy's face lighted up with hope again. They had a long discussion, before the doctor would consent to consult with him, but after that they seemed to change the medicines. But something must have gone wrong, for I have never seen Dr. Dodsworth look so grave. 
August 1st. I think the end is drawing very near now. This last attack has weakened me more than ever, and I write this in my bed. I shall never rise from it again. My poor, poor Willie. Three days I have been in bed now, and I have taken nothing from any hand but his. August 17th. This is, I think, almost the last entry I shall make. Another fortnight, and I shall be too weak to hold the pen, if indeed I am still here. September 5th. Another attack. Strange how this weary body bears up against all this pain. Would that it were over, and yet, my poor, poor boy. He too is almost worn out. Night and day he never leaves me. I take the things from his hand, but I cannot taste them now. Nothing but lead. September 27th. Farewell, my husband, my darling, my own precious Willie. Think of me. Come soon to me. God bless you. God comfort you, my darling, my own. In the hand of Mr. Anderton, on this day my darling died. October 12th, 1856. End of section 3